Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Viglione, co-founder of Horizon and also uh, the team lead for the public blockchain project Horizon and also the CEO of Horizon Labs, which is a software company building on the Horizon public blockchain. So uh, I, I guess what I want to do today is um, just go over a brief introduction to what is what is blockchain, right? And we'll, we'll keep it very general, uh, high level, and we can go into as many details as you like. Um, and I'll also go through what is Horizon, the public blockchain project that I co-founded in 2017 as a privacy coin uh, in this public this world of public blockchain, which includes Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, those you know, projects like that. And then I'll talk about what we're doing that's, that's different and where I think the industry is going and how people can participate, especially uh, students these days, what you can do today to make yourself more competitive tomorrow um, so that you can actually be part of this. So let me go through. I My background is uh, as a hard scientist uh, originally in physics, mathematics. Uh, I did, I, I did um, um, a tour of duty in the U.S. Air Force, and while I was there, I was part of Space Command and uh, worked actually functionally as a software project manager um, at the tail end of my career with, uh, with the Air Force. Uh, from there, I went into consulting and then got into some more military intelligence work, as people from the Air Force often do, uh, more on the data science side. When Bitcoin came along, uh, for me, it was back in 2012 uh, when I really started getting involved with uh, you know, the open source project Bitcoin, it resonated with me for a particular, uh, I don't know, call them, you know, ideological reasons. I love the idea of being able to decentralize uh, things that have been just centralized, um, centralized and exclusive, uh, exclusionary uh, things like banking systems, financial systems, even the idea of money. What is money? What do we do with it? How does it get created? Who distributes it? Uh, these are very interesting questions from you know, my background starting as a, you know, as a physicist, mathematician, I actually then went into economics and uh, my PhD work is in uh, finance. So a subfield of economics and just Bitcoin resonated with me for just this egalitarian, um, you know, idealistic reasoning of, you know, let's make the world a better place. Let, let's try to disrupt the things that are just core to everyday life, like financial systems, um, you know, monetary systems, banking systems, let's try to decentralize that. Let's take a stab at trying to make the world more inclusive, uh, more fair, and uh, also more efficient. So that was, uh, you know, getting into Bitcoin relatively early uh, afforded me the opportunity to uh, go back to academia. And in academia for my PhD, I, I actually had the good opportunity to study finance uh, or study, I, I guess, uh, Crypto finance is what I was calling it at the time, and that's what it's called now. Is really the you know uh, take asset pricing, which is what I was really studying. Uh, you know, corporate finance as well. There's applications there, and apply it with these new technologies. Apply, uh, look at the financial characteristics of Bitcoin, uh, and then these subsequent projects that, that came around uh, after Bitcoin, and, and just do research there. So that's I was very lucky to have a department that allowed me during my my studies to actually study this thing um, was very new, and you know the department was probably you know anyone at the time could have said crazy to let me study this stuff because it, this was when I started my PhD in 2014. Um, this was still very very new stuff, and especially uh, for academia, this was brand new. Um, so Bitcoin was launched in 2009. January 2009 was the genesis block for Bitcoin based on a white paper that was published uh, in you know, late October, it was October uh, 2008. And going back to why Bitcoin exists, uh, there's a little hint in the Bitcoin blockchain. And, and we'll talk about what is a blockchain and you know, what is Bitcoin um, you know, shortly. But in the first block for Bitcoin, uh, the creator of Bitcoin, uh, who we really don't know who the creator or creators of Bitcoin are, um, he, she, they, Whoever it was put a message in the first block of Bitcoin. It was an encrypted message that referenced the bank bailouts uh, back in 2008. So, you know, the 2007 2008 financial crisis, central banks all over the world took coordinated actions to bail out their banking systems. Functionally, what this meant was actually pumping a lot of money into banks, uh, bailing them out when they took losses, acquiring banks, basically printing a lot of money, using the central bank and its ability to print money 
to bail out banks and therefore bail out the financial system. So if you talked to me 10 years ago, I would probably say this was an absolutely horrible thing and they're just diluting the money supply and just adding so much systemic risk. Um, now that I actually you know, have some PhD work under my belt, I, I understand why central banks did it and I understand the, um, you know, the crisis that was ongoing at the time and why central banks took the actions they did to attempt to, um, yep, sorry about that, uh, attempt to alleviate uh, contagion. So basically they didn't want a cascade of banks failing and you know a cascade of problems in the financial system. So I get it, um, but fast forward from 2008 uh, to where we are today and Bitcoin uh, coming about at least in part, at least motivated in part uh, because of central banks actions in the 2007, 2008 crisis, um, you know, creating a new monetary system, creating a monetary system that's completely decentralized permissionless, no one controls it. And importantly for computer science and, and you know, programming students, it's programmable money. So that's the really, the big innovation is removing third parties from uh, having to control money or create money and then being able to do things really in, in the modern digital age where you can add code, add logic um, to money flows and, and do this real time and do this in, in a way that's completely automated and accessible to everyone in the world really was a breakthrough. So when I came about this, and you know, for me it was really 2012 before I started getting involved, um, it, it was it was pretty mind mind blowing for me, and, and I loved being able to actually go back to academia and, and uh, study this. Um, actually, a, a quick quick anecdote was I, I first got involved with Bitcoin actively supporting the project uh, when I was doing a tour of duty in Afghanistan, and I uh, decided, hey, this is really good because I, I know that at least all. Uh, Really, many of the Afghans that we were working with and that, that I knew were very skeptical of their local currency, the Afghani, and uh, they knew it was extremely risky, volatile, and prone to just um, extreme devaluations. And this is not uh, good for your financial uh, future planning, uh, financial planning future, where you have to plan uh, with a currency that could completely collapse at any moment. Um, so I, I figured this would actually be. Uh, Bitcoin would be an interesting alternative for people in Afghanistan, at least, or these other very volatile countries where they could actually, uh, you know, here's an instrument that they can, you know, uh, put their resources into and get them out of their, uh, their, their more volatile jurisdictions. At the time, I would say, I, I mean, that's true. And I've, I've done some research on the academic side that shows that there are uh, people in countries that are highly volatile, you know, like highly volatile jurisdictions, lack of property rights, uh, volatile monetary regimes, and so forth, uh, big dictatorships, uh, people in, in countries that are not the best economies or you know, systems to be part of economic life, they do actually um, seek out cryptocurrencies these days. Um, and the market, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a uh, high-level overview, you know, what it entails, but there are attractive ways for people to put resources and contribute into a global framework here that we have in, in the cryptocurrency and, and blockchain world. So for me, uh, you know, going to academia and studying this stuff, I, I even uh, was hired back as an adjunct faculty member to teach a Bitcoin and blockchain applications and finance course. Um, so I don't have my slides from the course. Uh, this is more high level than that. Um, but that really the bottom line is academia is catching on, financial institutions are catching on, banks are catching on, governments are catching on, uh, software companies for sure are catching on. There's something huge going on here in this industry. So blockchain as a technology, as a tech stack, blockchain um, in its applications like cryptocurrency and other applications like smart contracting and things that we can do going beyond cryptocurrency, it's catching on. People realize there's something really big and important going on here. Uh, and it's very important for students to be paying attention and for students to start getting some familiarity with the technology behind really this, this new revolution. So that's me in a nutshell, we can talk about any, any aspect of that uh, you know, later on in the Q&A, but um, just going into what is blockchain, I think this is really important for, um, you know, depending on, on your backgrounds, if you don't have much experience in, in uh, the industry, I'll keep this very generic. Uh, our marketing team um, did, did me a big favor and put together some slides uh, last night. So um, these were really just placeholders for me to have discussion points for you. I'm not gonna go through them word for word, but a blockchain, the way I look at it, I mean, it, it is at its core, a peer-to-peer -peer distributed database. 
Um, however you want to analogize that, whether you say it's like a book and each, each block is like a page in that book and, and you bundle transactions, transactions get broadcast by any peer. That means anyone that wants to run the software and connect to the network from their computer, or from a server, they can do that from their phone. Uh, you can connect a peer to the network and you can broadcast a transaction. The thing with these public blockchains, and there are private blockchains, by the way, companies like IBM, Microsoft, um, you know, R3 Corda, like, there are other companies that have private blockchains for particular enterprise businesses. And we can talk about those you know, later on as well, if they make sense and why, why or where they might make sense. But I come from the public blockchain world, that, the Bitcoin world. You know, uh, Horizon with its cryptocurrency, Zen, is part of this public blockchain world where anyone has the right to just download our software from GitHub, uh, download a wallet, which includes the software, connect your wallet, and you just launch your wallet, it automatically connects to it, you know, a peer in the network, and you're part of the network. You are a peer that is equal, if you're running a full node, to anyone else in the network. No one has, say, super admin privileges over you. No one has any, any kind of pri more privileges over you than that node that you just added to the network. And you can do things like broadcast a transaction to the rest of the network. There are certain types of transactions that you can broadcast depending on the type of blockchain. Let's keep it simple and just think about this in terms of like the money application like Bitcoin or Zen. And you're broadcasting a transaction, say, I'm sending, you know, Lucy, who helped me put these slides together, I'm sending her, her some Zen. Um, and we can, I can broadcast this transaction to the network. I sign the transaction, just my wallet automatically signs it with the private key, this, this part of that wallet. Um, you could, there are other Roth transactions that you can do. And if you're a programmer and want to actually get into transaction types and logic, you could broadcast, you could use um, a Roth transaction and sign it um, manually uh, with a private key. Uh, the private key related to the address in which the cryptocurrency, the Zen, is, uh, is stored. And then you can broadcast that transaction. I can broadca broadcast it to the network. Every peer in the network, right now, uh, Horizon, uh, our network has the most peers of any network, the most nodes, we have over 40,000 nodes registered with our network, which means we have many more nodes that just aren't even registered. Uh, with us, people register because we actually um, have a subsidy that goes out to people that run infrastructure. So people actually want to register uh, and prove that they're running a high quality server and get paid to do it. Uh, so we know that we have over 40,000 nodes in our network and my transactions trying to send money to Lucy will be broadcast to the first uh, eight nodes that my peer is connected to, and then it will just disperse from there. Every node from there will disperse it to every other node that is connected to, and within roughly a second, every node in the world will have that transaction that shows proof that Rob sent his his Zen, or whatever you know, fraction of Zen to Lucy, and Lucy received that. So there'll be a transfer, a state update in the, the public ledger, so basically the, the database that uh, archives records of who owns uh, the current state or really who owns um, you know, what Zen, what address each Zen is part of, um, that state for the blockchain will be updated and the entire world will know that Lucy's address uh, to which I just sent some Zen owns that Zen. My private key will never be able to access that Zen again because it's no longer in my control. Essentially, this is what a blockchain is. Um, you know, when I was telling this to, trying to explain uh, what a blockchain is to my finance students, I would tell them it's like, uh, you know, owning a Bitcoin or owning a Zen is like owning a slice of real estate, um, you know, it, uh, owning a little slice of real estate on the ledger. So we've got this public ledger with a finite number of coins uh, that represent, um, you know, value on that ledger. And, um, you know, you having a private key is like you owning some real estate on that ledger. So, and again, guys, any questions that you might have, uh, please, in the Q&A, we can you know, go into any of these details. So a core innovation with blockchain, uh, and the reason why it, it is able to uh, remove middlemen from, from the loop, and, and we'll, we'll see the, the system architecture in the next slide, but uh, there are rules for who is allowed to broadcast a certain type of transaction. Hence, everyone is allowed to broadcast a certain type of you know, transactions. Like if you have Zen, everyone in the world is allowed to connect to the network and send Zen if they own Zen. Uh, but there are certain rules for how these transactions are um, added to blocks and then added to the ledger. Uh, this just collectively, this, this set of rules we call the consensus of the blockchain. And there's a whole complicated network of soft, you know, software and participants in the network that have certain roles and certain work to perform. 
in the simplest um, simplest examples, just Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, and the the workers, the most important workers in the Bitcoin network are a group called miners. Miners, uh, you know, don't ask me why they chose the the name miner, but I think it was an uh, analogy to the idea of Bitcoin being like gold because there's a finite money supply. <clears throat> and this, again, compared in 2007, 2008 to central banks printing trillions of currency units and actually, you know, that on steroids today during the COVID uh, central bank reactions. But the idea of Bitcoin was to have a finite money supply. They can't ever be inflated away. <clears throat> so this was from a, <clears throat> like a, a, an experiment in the idea of what is money. This was a fantastic experiment, but you can see just even by the, the nomenclature, what, what uh, people call certain types of roles like miners, uh, it, it's an analogy to what, what the originators of Bitcoin wanted the network to do, wanted the application to do, uh, which is really to act as a new form of money. So what miners are, is they're workers in this, this peer network that perform a special function. The function they perform is they collect uh, and aggregate all you know a bunch of transactions whenever they they land into the memory pool of their node they ag they aggregate them together and they they um, join a, a race basically a computational race to see who can uh, in, in the case of Bitcoin who can solve a computational puzzle basically it's it's um, doing a hash function so it constantly generate just massive string of hashes and look at the results of the hash and see if you have you know a certain number of leading zeros, so like if you look at the, the output of like a, a hash function like SHA-256, you'll see just a scram, like a, a string of characters, um, you know, like letters, numbers, just just a string. And uh, what what um, Satoshi Nakamoto did, the, the creator or creators of Bitcoin, is they set a rule that said to prove that you're doing work uh, and to, to win the right to add your block to this ledger, um, you have to continuously generate um, you know, uh, these hash functions, look at the results and see that the winner of the race will be the one that uh, is the first to report to the network that they have achieved the right number of leading zeros. I, I don't know what it is now, 16, 18 leading zeros. It's very hard to do. So if you, um, you know, use your command line to go and start generating SHA-256 um, your computations, you'll see it's a completely random thing. So in, in the uh, you know the the 256 modulo you know, modulo p space in, in which the SHA-256 algorithm resides. Uh, it is a real um, you know it, it, it is a real miracle to be able to come up with you know, the right number of leading zeros in the string output that, that you would obtain. So this is what it is though. This is the competitive race. And you know some people think that mining like proof of work mining like like uh, the the pro process that I just described is. Uh, you know, some people, um, you know, are, are critique it and say it's a complete waste of electricity. It's a complete waste of resources to have all of these uh, workers, all of these, um, you know, dedicated systems around the world, computation, uh, computational systems, generating useless hash functions just so that one of them can win a race and you know, win the right to add their block to the network. Um, there, there is a counter argument to that. Um, you know, so yes, for sure, there's a lot of electricity that's used in proof of work to do that. And yes, we can probably come up with better, more efficient ways that are less energy intensive. And we absolutely should as an industry. Um, many projects have. Um, Horizon, just so you know, has a proof of work core blockchain, but we're collapsing our average uh, electricity usage per transaction by creating a, a parallel blockchain system called like a side sheet system that has lots of blockchains that operate in parallel in this ecosystem, all linked or interoperable with a core proof of work blockchain for security. But if you look at just the, the total network and everything that's happening, uh, the average electricity cost per transaction or usage on the network collapses when you do this. It's still not zero. Um, so you still have to burn electricity to secure the Verizon network. You have to burn a heck of a lot of electricity to secure the Bitcoin network. So there are workers in the system and there were rules of the game of how people are allowed to uh, participate and how people come to consensus, you know, in, in really like the, the nomenclature of that means consensus, everyone in the network by design of the software agrees that uh, state transitions are valid and that, that workers that you know, win this race and append their block of transactions to the network had a legitimate right to do so. So that's what consensus is in a nutshell, and, and that's the way it works in the Bitcoin network, the Verizon network, and many other proof of work blockchains. 
there is another popular consensus type, um, you know, and really going to who, who has the right to add a block of transactions to the ledger, and it's called proof of stake. So really, at the end of the day, all you need is to, for everyone to agree in the software, uh, what are the rules for how someone gets to add a block of transactions to the ledger uh, and, and basically change the state of the network. And proof of stake is another way of doing this. It's basically a random draw proportionate, your, your likelihood of winning the race to add your block to the ledger is proportionate to the stake, say like uh, in, in Zen as an example, our side chains are proof of stake and our core blockchain is proof of work. So on the proof of stake side chains, um, you know, workers who are called block forgers, not miners in the proof of stake world, but the proof of stake equivalent of a miner is, is called a forger. And the, the way that you compete in this, this uh, proof of stake framework is you add Zen, you commit Zen, you say, I'm locking up, say it's a thousand Zen, maybe I'm locking up 10,000 Zen. So the, the worker who locks up 10,000 Zen has a 10 times chance of winning that block race as the worker who locked up 1,000 Zen. That's what proof of stake means. So it's a proportionate race, uh, or a race proportionate to um, your stake that you you lock up, basically, to prove that you've done something. And that's the whole point here: is you want to make sure that it's not a free ride, and everyone agrees to some rules, and people are taking some actions that give them the right to add transactions to the ledger. So again, we can cover any of this in Q and A. I know I talk a lot, guys, but really, this these systems are revolutionary, exciting, and there's so much to them. Um, this is really just um, you know, kind of a, a repeat of, of what I just said. I was getting ahead of myself on who, who gets to do it. Now, the big benefit of these peer-to-peer -peer replicated databases that we call blockchains is that uh, one characteristic is, one result is that you get immutability in a way. So it's really a probabilistic sense of immutability. Here's what I mean. Is if I broadcast, I, I'm sending 10 Zen to Lucy and you know, I broadcast my transaction, I've signed it, the network you know, nodes on the network, get the transaction, add it to the memory pool, broadcast it to every other node in there that they're connected to, and it just you know, very quickly propagates to the rest of the network. Everyone in the network knows that I've transferred 10 Zen to Lucy. Um, and then, um, so you know, all of the workers in the network are gathering um, the transactions in their memory pools, and you know, put together a block template, add the transactions to the block template, and then try to win the race, set, win the rights, add their block to the, to the chain. If they win the race, and why would anyone in their right mind want to even participate in this race? You get paid Zen if you, you win this race. There's a certain amount of Zen that gets allocated to the winner of the race. We call this a block subsidy. Same thing for Bitcoin. So for, in the Bitcoin network, Every miner uh, that wins the race to add their block to the Bitcoin blockchain wins uh, a prescribed amount of Bitcoin with every block. And economically, there's, there's a prescribed path for how much Bitcoin, how much Zen is available in the block subsidy at any given time. Um, and, and this is what happens. So once the block has been added to the chain, immediately miners who are trying to win the next block add a block, a, a backward pointing block reference to the previous block, and then they start win, trying to win the race for this block, for the next block. As soon as they win that race, then all of the miners in the network move on to the next one with backward pointing references, so hashes of the previous block, they reference the, the block header of the previous block, they reference the block header of the block before that, they reference the block header of the block before the block before that, and so on, recursively all the way back to the genesis block in the chain. And in this sense, as soon as uh, my transaction is added to the ledger that I've sent Lucy 10 Zen, it is exceedingly difficult for someone to try to reverse these transactions. Essentially what they would have to do is they would have to reverse the entire string of, of blocks added to the chain and change the transaction at, at the point in which it occurred, it was added to the blockchain. Now, as more blocks are added to the chain, the probability of being able to go back and change a transaction that occurred at n blocks, you know, further back in the chain, becomes exponentially more difficult. And this is what we mean by the property of immutability. Once something gets added to the blockchain, it is almost probabilistically impossible to reverse that transaction the further back you go in the chain. So you can think about the math function here that the more blocks get added and the deeper you know, transaction is in the chain, you know, the, the probability of being able to change that drops asymptotically to zero, you know, the further, you, you know, the tip of that blockchain moves forward in time. 
Uh, this now is great for money because there's great assurance that once your transaction is added to the chain, it's yours. Th that Zen is Lucy's and I could do nothing in the world to you know, take it from Lucy because I don't have Lucy's private, private key. Now you can think about other transactions where this could be extremely useful as well. Like in developing worlds that might, in the developing world, in places that may not have, uh, might not have uh, robust property records or land registries, if you can come up with some way that is, um, you know, from a judicial system's perspective, palatable and acceptable to add, to add a description of the title or plot of land that someone owns to a blockchain, like a land registry blockchain, it would be exceedingly difficult for someone later in time, maybe they're a corrupt, a corrupt official, maybe they're a scammer, to claim that they own this bit of real estate if it's already been recorded in the ledger and someone else retains the keys to that property. Um, so th this is the, the big benefit of a public blockchain is it becomes very, very difficult to change transactions once they're added to the ledger. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I know I'm talking a lot, we're already about 30 minutes in here, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. We're, we're kind of nearing the end of what is blockchain. Um, why this is exciting, because there are so many things in the world that you have trillion dollar industries built on, like banking, that are centralized. And you know, it, just this schematic right here that just quickly describes the architecture, look at the left side and say this is pre-blockchain, pre-Bitcoin, and look at the right side and say this is the possibility now that we have Bitcoin in the sense of like money, money settlement, so clearing and settlement used by banks. In the banking system, you have a very centralized system where you have a clearing house that clears transactions for a network of banks and says that this transaction is valid, funds that, you know, if someone tried to broadcast a wire transfer or an ACH transfer, some other transfer from their bank account to another bank account, you would have a clearinghouse, some entity that would be able to, you know, uh, access the records from one bank and, and verify, yes, that client in the bank, this bank account number actually had those funds and that let me uh, you know, verify to the world that this new bank account to which the funds were sent owns those funds. Now we can do that by removing the middleman. Uh, we can do this for many more things beyond just money and beyond just payments and, and fund transfers. We can do this in a way you can think about Uber. Uber is an application, it's a centralized application. Do we need it or could we actually have a decentralized Uber? One that's actually built pure software and remove the company from the loop. I don't know, no one's actually done that at scale yet, but this is just one example of maybe something else that we can do. There are many other things that we can do in a decentralized fashion that might be more important than uh, your, might, might actually be better business models, or maybe not even better, just different business models. And my prediction for where we're heading economically, you know, say the next 10 or 20 years is this technology and why it's so important, it will entirely disrupt some industries. Some industries, 10 years from now will not be recognizable um, to the way they are today or the way they were 10 years ago. Um, many industries will be affected, meaning there will be many applications, whether they're back office applications that are just more efficient, um, you know, using the peer-to-peer -peer blockchain uh, context. Um, and you will see elements of businesses, uh, you know, transformed or made more efficient because of this technology. And then there will be a set of uh, industries and ways of doing business and the ways, of, you know, the, the people uh, interact with each other that won't be impacted at all. So let's not get ahead of ourselves and think that blockchain is going to entirely change everything in the world. It's not, not at all. There are some use cases for which blockchain actually makes sense, and we could talk about some of those. And there are many other use cases for which blockchain doesn't make sense. If you want to think of a, a, a a reason for why blockchain might not make sense. If you have an application that's just within your company, or maybe it's you and your wife uh, running a, a shared spreadsheet, or if within your company you have a, a spreadsheet, you probably don't need to share that spreadsheet in a replicated peer to peer network for, with any, anyone in the world able to access it, right? It's probably overkill. You could probably replicate, put that uh, spreadsheet in, in, in the best case scenario, uh, on, on a cloud application, so it's distributed across some servers and you're not gonna lose it if say your computer gets destroyed. There are many other ways of doing business that don't require blockchain. And I think that as entrepreneurs or as programmers, if you're looking for a job, think about the types of businesses that are going to, if they start advertising that they're doing something in blockchain, make sure that it actually makes sense or it may not exist some years from now and you may be out of a job. So Horizon, uh, you know, coming back to why we exist. So we have a very lofty and probably too grandiose mission statement here is we, we really want to empower people. I, I came into Bitcoin because I saw this, this big idealistic uh, vision for you know, what we can do with this technology. 
Uh, people in the industry who are idealistic, you know, say things like bank the unbanked. Uh, it's really the idea of there are many people in the world that are just disenfranchised from the old way of doing business, the old way of doing banking, the old way of, you know, uh, um, having economic systems that, that are more hierarchical, top down. And the idea was to open up the world, unite the world, bring people together and make technology level the playing field. That was the idea here. Horizon, very specifically, and for some specific reasons, we, we, uh, we have it baked into our technology to empower people and really to bring people together. It's a permissionless network. And actually, from the developer's perspective, developers actually have built-in revenue models by building on our, on our platform because we've built uh, transaction revenue streams that go directly to developers that launch their own blockchains within our ecosystem. So it's a nice organic, endogenous way for people to earn revenue by building our system right away. Or as their system scale, like if you launch an application uh, on, on your own blockchain in Horizon, and we have an SDK to do this, uh, you actually have a built-in revenue stream so that you could earn money by doing that. And that's just one, one flavor of what I mean by empowering people. Um, and, you know, our system is meant to be sustainable, you know, support, you know, wide, heterogeneous, diverse ecosystem over time. It's a fun project. If you guys like anything that I mentioned here today, you can check out some cool swag. You scan the QR code we have here. I'm not sure if the slides will be uh, made available to you guys afterwards, but happy to do that. Uh, we have a store, join our project. Uh, you know, we, we, we also have a, a Horizon Early Adopter Program specifically for developers. And we have another program called the Horizon Developer Environment, HDE, uh, which is really a, a curated open source contribution portal where we want to give programmers, everyone from someone who's just learning how to program today to the most senior software architect in the world, we want them to have all have opportunities to contribute directly to our open source project. And we actually pay people to do this. There's actually bounties you know, tagged onto every task in HDE. Uh, come check it out, it's hde.horizon.io. Um, and I, you know, if nothing else, if you think that this stuff's just cool, uh, come to horizon.io uh, and you, know, you can check out our white papers. We have a whole bunch of technical scientific white papers that describe our technology. Um, and we, we have a, a huge community actually, a very motivated people that love the project. You can just come into our Discord channel and chat and hang out. You know, it's a pretty fun, motivated environment. So guys, that's really what I have here. We have, uh, like I just mentioned, um, you know, you can scan the QR code on the right here, which is the early adopter program heap, uh, or on the left, if you wanna just get started. And this idea of cryptocurrency is just a little daunting. Uh, what I recommend is we have something called a faucet, which is like faucet drips, drip, drip. It drips Zen out of the faucet. So you can come to the faucet webpage and it's get, get zen.cash and get some free Zen. It's like micro microtransactions in Zen. It'll uh, prompt you to download a wallet, help you set it up. We have a whole bunch of tutorials and then you can just get some free Zen. So you can just get started right away actually playing with, with the, the cryptocurrency. Um, so that's it guys. Uh, we have a whole bunch of ways for you to come and participate. If you wanna be hands-on, if you just wanna be part of the community, we welcome everyone. Mm -hmm.